I am here on behalf of Minnesotans for Compassionate Care, a coalition of organizations, medical professionals, patients, and um, concerned citizens who are working to remove the, the threat of arrest and prosecution for patients using medical marijuana pursuant to the advice of their doctors. I would like to thank our legislators and patients for being here today, and thank you for being here as well. Minnesotans support medical marijuana by a majority a significant majority in Minnesota. Two-thirds of our voters feel that Governor Dayton should sign this medical marijuana bill when it hits his desk next year. <coughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> lost my train of thought. Um, a poll conducted this month by Public Policy Polling found that nearly two-thirds of Minnesota voters support changing the law so that people with serious and terminal medical conditions can use medical marijuana with the advice of their doctor. That is what is proposed today, and we hope that is what patients and their families are finally going to get. Before you hear Representative Carly Moline and Representative Tom Hackbarth discuss the details of the proposal, I would like to give the floor to Joni Whiting, who will, tell you, uh, who will give you a first-hand account of why we have a need for this legislation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joni Whiting, J-O-N-I-W-H-I-T-I-N-G. I just need to put this here for one second. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here today so I can share my story, my family's story. More specifically here, I am here to tell you the story of my daughter, Stephanie, a hard worker, loving wife, and amazing mother of three. In June of 2000, Stephanie was diagnosed with melanoma skin cancer on her face, a mole that had developed during her third pregnancy. The next two years were filled with experimental therapies and endless surgeries. As they cut her face off one inch at a time, until there was nothing left to cut. The pain she was experiencing was unimaginable, and the nausea was so severe that it became difficult for her to eat. That was when a doctor at the hospital pulled me aside and told me that Stephanie might benefit from using marijuana. At the time, we didn't consider it an acceptable option. I was strongly opposed to the use of marijuana and my home had always been drug free. Moreover, the consequences associated with marijuana's illegal status were frightening. After Stephanie's 10th surgery, I'm on the wrong page, excuse me. All efforts to save her life had failed, and her oncologist predicted that she had about six months to live. As her term was continued to grow, her whole body was racked with continuous and uncontrollable pain. No matter how much Oxycontin or Roxycodone she took, it part provided her little to no relief. Extreme nausea was resulting in dangerously rapid weight loss and anti-nausea medications including Marinol, a synthetic form of THC, one of the active chemicals in marijuana, simply did not work. At that point, my other adult children begged me to let Stephanie use marijuana. When I refused, they took her out of my home so that she could use it. When she came back three days later, she looked better than I had seen her in months. Whereas she'd been eating nothing for days, she was eating three meals a day then, using marijuana, and keeping the food down. And for reasons I don't know, marijuana also seemed to enhance the effects of her pain medication without making her feel high. When that doctor first di suggested Stephanie use medical marijuana, my fear of being caught was too significant to overcome. But once I saw how much relief it provided my suffering daughter, I was willing to risk everything 
including going to jail. I would rather have spent the rest of my life in prison than deny her the medicine that helped her to live for 89 more days. I don't use drugs. I don't abuse alcohol. I'm a veteran. I'm a mother and I'm a great grandmother. I've raised four children and I'm now raising the, the children my daughter had to leave behind. As a lifelong volunteer, I have dedicated a large portion of my own life to helping people stay clean and drug-free. But I saw with my own eyes that for medical purposes, marijuana works. People say that there is no greater loss than when a parent loses their child, and they are right. I lost my mother three weeks after my daughter and my husband six months after my mother. Neither of them used marijuana because they didn't need it. At this point, nothing can be done for me and nothing can be done for my daughter. But there is something that can be done for those families across Minnesota that are currently dealing with similar situations. We need merely to open our eyes and see their pain, even if it isn't as obvious as in Stephanie's case. They deserve compassion, dignity, and honor. And that is what this bill will provide. I thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I'm Representative Carly Moline, and thank you to Ms. Whiting for sharing her very touching and emotional story. Uh, it's a good reminder to all of us that the proposed legislation to use medical marijuana is not about um, politics. It's about people, and it's about the families that this could benefit here in Minnesota. Um, I'm honored to be standing here with my colleagues to uh, propose medical marijuana legislation here in Minnesota. Um, to help Minnesotans that are suffering from very serious illnesses, um, such as Ms. Whiting's daughter was suffering from, and to help ease their pain. Um, this, legisla this legislation will allow Minnesotan Minnesota residents with qualifying medical conditions, such as cancer and MS, to no longer face legal penalties for possessing up, a, um, up to a small amount of marijuana. Patients will require recommendations from a medical professional with the power to pres prescribe medications, such as their physician, to legally obtain and use marijuana with a state-issued ID. With these ID cards, patients will be afforded legal, safe, and consistent access to medical marijuana via nonprofit medical marijuana dispensaries that will be tightly regulated by the State Department of Health. And the number of disp dispensaries is limited and subject to licensure and an inspection by the Commissioner of Health. This legislation strikes the appropriate balance between compassion, health, and safety. It, it protects and provides relief to some of our state's most vulnerable citizens, and it does in a manner that is well regulated and well controlled. Um, I think that, you know, after hearing this Whiting story, and I've heard from a number of constituents who have watched their family members. Um, die in extreme pain and turmoil. Uh, this is a matter of compassionate care. This is allowing doctors, physicians to decide when their patients can benefit from medical marijuana. And we're doing it in a very um, well-regulated fashion. Um, and I, you know, I hope that we can move forward from this and continue to hear from families and have their support through this process. And I want to thank my colleagues for being here um, today. And now you'll hear from Representative Tom Hackbarth. Thank you, Carly, and uh, thank you, Ms. Whiting, and uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, this is not a, a partisan issue, and uh, uh, believe it or not, the Republicans have a heart and they have uh, compassion as well. Uh, the reason I'm here today and the reason I support this bill, and I have for a long time now, I was a co-author on the bill in 2009, and uh, um, it's, a, it's, it's a matter of uh, the quality of life in your final days for me. Uh, I've, I've had a lot of friends that have uh, been in this uh, particular 
position. And uh, maybe some of you know that uh, my wife is uh, um, terminal at this point. And uh, it's all about quality of life. Quality of life is so important. I've been talking to a number of my wife's doctors, and that's what we've been striving for, is a quality of life. Um, there's been a number of different uh, issues that my wife is facing. I thought that we might be losing her about a month and a half ago, and, uh, and uh, with some a pacemaker installed and uh, some other uh, medications that she's taking, uh, she's done a, a huge turnaround. She's still terminal, but the quality of life has improved so much. Uh, she's not smoking mar uh, marijuana, and I, I don't think she'll need to, but uh, uh, quality of life is what it's all about, and, and that's what we're talking about here in those final days. And uh, it, it's good for other issues, uh, MS, et cetera, but uh, for me, it's those uh, final days that you face and the quality of life that uh, we need to uh, have for uh, these patients. So uh, we'd stand for questions if you have questions. Anybody else want to say a few words? We all always hear when this comes up um, from the people who veto these bills or choose not to support them that they're waiting for the support of law enforcement. What, what efforts have you made to get law enforcement on board with this? Um, well, you know, I would say in that regard, I have a high respect for law enforcement. Actually, my dad and brother are both in law enforcement. Um, I'm an attorney. Um, none of us are trained in the medical field. I think that we should leave um, making medical decisions up to doctors, um, not to law enforcement. So that's where I'm at with it right now. I think that this is going to be one of the most restrictive laws in the country. It's going to be very well regulated. Um, very limited scope on the dispensaries and which patients even qualify for medical marijuana. I think that that should concern or alleviate a lot of concerns of law enforcement. Will it alleviate all of them? Um, maybe not, but I do think that medical decisions should be left up to physicians. Is there a difference between what you're proposing and what they've made law in, let's say, Colorado, where they're threatened by uh, a federal injunction there? Um, this, as I stated, I do believe will be one of the most restrictive laws in the country. Um, the dispensaries will be limited to um, one dispensary in each county in greater Minnesota, um, three in Hennepin County, two in Ramsey County. So there'll be very limited places where you're actually able to obtain the medical marijuana. Um, from my understanding, um, the federal government hasn't um, enforce drug laws against states that are using medical marijuana properly, except in a few instances, such as in California. Um, this legislation is not like what California has. Um, we want to make that very clear that um, this is a pretty limited scope of which patients would qualify. Describe the product for us, if you could. Is this, is, would the marijuana be grown at like a, um, a federally, federally regulated facility or a state regulated facility? Would it even be produced in Minnesota or is this something, a product that you get from out of state? I might have to divert to somebody else to answer that question on, um, I know that it will be regulated by the um, state commissioner of health, but if somebody else wants to answer more thoroughly. Sure, I can do that. Yes. Um, the, the Commissioner of Health will have discretion to determine how many, exactly how many dispensaries will be licensed and regulated around the state. Um, there's a very small number that he's required to establish. He has discretion to establish more beyond that. So the, the marijuana would be grown locally here in Minnesota at state licensed dispensaries that are well regulated. Are you guys concerned at all about pressure from the DEA? No. No. Um, the DEA has very limited law enforcement resources. They do not typically come into states and arrest and prosecute individuals, especially patients and their caregivers, who are using marijuana pursuant to a, a doctor's recommendation. They simply do not have the resources to do that. Do you think you have the votes in the legislature? I mean, this is a legislature that can't even legalize wine in the grocery stores. Do you think there's support for marijuana dispensaries in the Minnesota legislature? Yeah, I think there is. Uh, we passed this bill in 2009 and sent it to the governor, and the governor vetoed it. Um, I've not polled this uh, legislature, but uh, I think we've got support in the legislature to pass it, and, and that's why we're introducing the bill now. Um, we've had, we've uh, been facing the budget issue over the last uh, entire session, and, and we're introducing it now so we can gain support, talk to legislators, and then really hit it hard, hit the ground running when se uh, session starts next year. So that's, that's the goal, get people on board and uh, talk about it over the summer. And I, I think we're going to gain a lot of support, uh, both on the Republican side and the, and the DFL side. Does it help that I'm 
other states have begun passing similar laws? I think it helps, yeah. Since 2009, I, I, I think that's changed things a little bit. Um, you know, when I'm out door knocking, uh, no one ever brings it up. If they do bring it up, it's uh, people that are in support, and, and it's a good thing. I've gotten a number of emails uh, just this before session started, just uh, maybe November, December, uh, people asking me where I stood on it and uh, if we were going to be bringing a bill forward. Preliminary conversations have you had with the governor to, to move him off his stated opposition to this? Um, well, as Representative Hackbarth just um, said, you know, we're just introducing it right now to get the discussion going. Uh, right now, you know, we are focusing on the budget. This is more something we're going to be pursuing next legislative session. Um, I know that Governor Dayton has had concerns in the past, and those have been aligned with law enforcement. I think that um, he's an open person, and he's going to be willing to listen to the families, um, such as Ms. Whiting, who described how this um, really helped her daughter. And um, like I said, I've heard from a number of constituents who've had to watch their family members suffer and who really feel like this would have been beneficial to them. And I think that the governor is certainly open to listening to those um, stories over the next year. Does anyone have a guess how many people would take advantage of this, assuming it would become law? Are we talking about dozens of people or hundreds of people? Or, you know? um, well, as I said, because of the limited scope, you know, the estimate is that it would probably only be a few thousand people. Um, you know, they'd have to have a chronic illness, such as a severe chronic illness, such as cancer or MS, um, and their doctor would have to make the assessment that this sort of um, medication would be appropriate or beneficial to them. So I think that, you know, in that regard, we're probably only talking about a few thousand people statewide. How does that work? Does the doctor have to write a prescription? Yes, the doctor would have to write a prescription just as a doctor writes a prescription for medication now. Joni, can we ask you another question real quick? When you hear the, uh, the concerns about law enforcement, can you go up to the microphone? When you hear concerns about uh, law enforcement and those types of things standing in the way, is, is that frustrating uh, to you as a, as a parent? Very much so, and it makes me want to talk to them in person. It makes me want to show them the picture of my daughter and ask them, do they even have an, any idea what kind of pain we're talking about that helps the people that suffer from these diseases. They have no idea. My, my daughter wore her pain on her face, as you saw. But when you cover it up, nobody sees how bad it is. It's bad. I've, I've actually spoken to a number of law enforcement officers. Last, last time I testified was for the Justice Committee. And they had a lot of police officers there and a lot of um, like commissioner people, people that are in high places in law enforcement. And to my face, they all said, we wouldn't have arrested you. But they shouldn't have arrested anybody that's in my shoes or my daughter's shoes. What would you say to the governor if you had a chance to talk to him about his concerns about law enforcement? I say he's the governor and that he should lead. That's what I say. I say that it's his responsibility to lead and then it's law enforcement's responsibility to do what he says. And if I don't see any difference between my, my doctor or my daughter's doctor prescribing me cocaine through oxycodone, then cannabis, you know, that, that someone can use. If it helps them, it helps them. We had no idea. She got Marinol. My daughter got Marinol. It's THC. And it did absolutely nothing for my daughter. It was only from her smoking it that it released some chemical that helped her. And it, it did keep her alive for another 89 days. It helped her to be able to eat for 89 more days. Munchies, I don't know what you want to call it, <laughs> but it worked, and I stand before you to give you that testimony. It worked, and we should not be denying it to anybody, and if I could talk to the governor myself, I would be more than happy to, and any law enforcement officer, I would be happy to talk to them and try and help them Figure out a way to make this legal for the people that need it. That's just where I'm at.
Thank you, sir. Somebody told us that the University of Minnesota already is authorized to dispense medical marijuana, but has never used that authority. Is, does anyone know anything about that? No, but I would like to add that we would like to work with law enforcement. If law enforcement has some issues with the bill, please come and help us uh, address those issues. We want to uh, work with law enforcement to get these things straightened out. I'm not going away. <laughs> How soon could people get a state ID card if the law passes? After enactment, the Department of Health will have a few months to establish rules for the program. Um, once those rules are established and they begin accept accepting applications, it will probably be another couple of months before cards will be issued. Any idea when dispensaries would open up? Um, what we've seen in other states is there is a significant de delay in the dispensing system um, between the commissioner having to, de 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 excuse me, between the commissioner having to devise rules for the program, get these guys licensed and running. Um, he'll be using a competitive bidding process to determine who will be um, granted a registration certificate to operate a dispensary. So there will take some time there to sort through all of that. Anything else? Thank you all for coming. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.